In the last segment, I discussed ODEs and how they relate to the real world, that is, the notion of an ODE as a model of a system from physics, economics, chemistry, biology, or so on and so forth. And I finished up by deriving the ODE model for the simple harmonic oscillator. So here's the equation. This term is gravity. This term is the spring force. This term is friction. And this term is ma. And this over here is the sum of the forces on the mass. In this segment, I'm going to go through another example, the pendulum. The pendulum is a mass m at the end of a rigid massless rod of length L operating under the influence of gravity. So the force is mg down on the bob, just like it was mg down on the mass before. One of the big differences in this problem is that the coordinates that we're going to be using are rotational rather than linear. So we're going to measure the position of the pendulum with an angle. Now even though the mass is feeling mg pulling straight down, the fact that there's a rigid rod that swings from some sort of a pivot point projects that force tangentially perpendicular to the rod, and the magnitude of that projected vector is mg sine theta. Now we're prepared to do the same thing that we did with the simple harmonic oscillator and consider how that mass reacts to that force. And again, the operative physics is F equals ma. Now the next thing we have to do is figure out how a is related to these angular coordinates. In particular, a the linear acceleration of the mass is related to the angular acceleration of the mass in proportion to the length. And you can think about this when you're going around a curve in a car. If you're going 45 degrees around the curve in the same amount of time and the curve has a wider radius, then you're going a lot faster, you're accelerating a lot faster. How to relate that to theta, like so. It's just the second derivative of theta. There's another term that we'll need here omega, which is the angular velocity, which is equal to theta prime, and omega is also equal to L times V. Except that we've got an issue there. I've got that upside down. There, that's better. So now we're almost prepared to write down the equation. Friction, linear friction, is generally proportional to velocity, which is equal to that in angular coordinates which is the same thing as that. And now we really are ready to write the equation. What I'm going to do now is write F equals MA at the bottom. And on the left hand side is the MA, and here's the resultant force from the uh, force of gravity and the friction. Now I'm going to write the two equations side by side, and I'm going to remove the sine goof that I made in the last one that I hope many of you caught. Here are the two equations with the correct signs in them. Signs are fiendishly hard to get right when you're writing force balances. To understand why the signs are the way they are, take a look at the drawing on the right. The way theta is defined, that force, mg sine theta, is going to make theta smaller, hence that minus sign right here. And this minus sign is because friction is always kind of opposite velocity. Now, let's look at these things really carefully. One of these equations is a linear ordinary differential equation, the top one, and the bottom one is a nonlinear ordinary differential equation. Linear functions look like constants times variables plus constants. Things like this, where y and x are the variables and a and b are the constants. So linear equations are not allowed to have in the powers of the variables, products of the variables, or transcendental functions involving the variables. So a linear function cannot have any of these. The pendulum equation has a sine theta in it. That's a transcendental function of the variable theta. That makes that ODE nonlinear. Those of you who know a bit more about this know that sine of theta is approximately equal to theta for small theta. And that means that the pendulum equations actually look linear if you only look at small theta, but we're looking broadly, so that doesn't hold here. Now, why is all this important? Because nonlinearity is a necessary condition for chaos. If the ODE is nonlinear, it's possible that there may not exist an analytic solution, one you can write down in functional form. 
This is called non-integrability. It's a slight abuse of the, the term for those of you, again, who know more about this. And non-integrability is a necessary and sufficient condition for chaos. Now, necessary and sufficient is the arrow that looks like this. And the arrow that looks like this implies that if either of the things on either side of it is true, then the other one is definitely true. Necessary condition says that you need nonlinearity for chaos, but that's not all you need. So it's certainly the case that if you're chaotic, you're nonlinear, but the other way doesn't necessarily go. There are some nonlinear systems that are not chaotic. Now, in cases where you can't write down a solution, you have to solve the ODE numerically with a computer. We'll talk about that in a later segment. You may have some experience with this. ODE 45 in MATLAB, for instance, is an ODE solver. Now, stepping back just a bit brings up an interesting issue. How the heck did anyone do any of this stuff before there were computers? The answer is not very much and quite painfully. Indeed, the word computer was the name for the low-level staff, women mostly, who carried out the mind-numbing sequences of arithmetic operations that were involved in solving the ODEs that mattered in World War II. That name transferred to these nice modern electronic machines that have relieved people of that drudgery. And the advent of those machines was what allowed the field of nonlinear dynamics to develop, starting in the late 60s, accelerating in the 70s, and then taking off in the 80s. This is experimental mathematics. The computer is the laboratory in this field. In a later segment, we'll talk about that laboratory instrument, as well as the potential issues should it misbehave in some way and give you the wrong solution. I wanted to circle back around to this word, non-integrability, before we finish up this segment. This word technically only makes sense if you're talking about non-dissipative systems, systems that are conservative or Hamiltonian. Those are all synonyms, as I've mentioned before. When you're working with systems like that, the word non-integrable has a very specific technical meaning that is a necessary and sufficient condition for chaos. For those of you who know more about this, means that there are fewer constants of the motion than there are axes in the phase space of the system. If that made no sense, don't worry about it. I'm abusing that term slightly in this course because it's awkward to have to write down can't be solved in closed form or can't be solved analytically every time I want to talk about a system that's dissipative and chaotic. So even though this technical term only formally makes sense for this particular class of systems, I'm going to use it as shorthand to mean this. There's lots more about all of this in Jim Meese's book on dynamical systems.